Hi, good day. I'm Paul from Solus. Today I'm going to be talking about the Solus Export Power Manager and take us through the commissioning process and setting up process of the EPM as well as the inverters it is controlling. Just to get a basic understanding of what the EPM does, it measures the grid power consistently every second it's measuring the grid power and when it sees that that grid power exceeds a set point, which is that limit that you're allowed to send to the grid, it controls the inverters through RS-405 Modbus. So it's, it's very easy to understand that the EPM needs two very important things to be able to do this job. Firstly, it needs to be able to communicate through to all the inverters. So it needs an RS-405 Modbus network set up correctly and the inverters addressed correctly. And then the second thing it needs is it needs voltage and current on each of the phases so it can calculate the and know about the um, real-time power on each of the phases so it can do its job. Okay, so here we've got the bottom of the EPM. On the left-hand side, a uh, very important plug is the voltage input plug for the inverter, for the EPM, apologies. And it's got three phases in the case of the three-phase models. And it's got phase A, phase B, and phase C neutral and earth. It's very important that you get the phase rotation correct in this plug because if the, if the voltages don't match, the CTs won't be able to match and you won't be getting correct real power values and the power factor will be wrong. So it's extremely important that you put phase one into the pin for phase one and two and three, etc. And then moving on to current. So this EPM needs voltage and current to, to measure power the real-time power of the grid. And these CTs are physically connected on the grid connection. It's very important that they're connected at the grid connections so they can monitor the consumption in the building as well as the PV inverter generation. And just as the voltages are important, it's very important that you match the CT is on phase one cable and the CT2 is on phase two and CT3 is on phase three. Again, if you mix those up, you'll be getting a bad power factor. It won't be measuring the real power correctly and the EPM will not be able to do its job correctly. And then you will, the last thing that is compulsory to set up is setting up the RS-405 communications. The EPM needs to be able to speak to the inverters to control them. And without this cable, it will not be able to control them and the system will not work. So this is compulsory. And then some optional connections to do. So this is an EPM 5G Plus, which has got an internal data logger. It does the monitoring for you. Um, whereas some of our other models like the EPM 5G Vanilla or single phase do not have an internal data logger. And you would use the four pin green plug um, to set up the data logger on um, to get it online. Just to, I don't think I said it, the, the port name for the RS-485 is COMINV. So this is a RS-485 network for the inverters and the port name is COMINV. INV stands for inverters. And then moving more to the right, we've got a LAN connector. So as I said, this is a 5G+. Plus. It's got an internal data logger. That data logger has a LAN um, connection as well as a Wi-Fi connection. So on the far right is an antenna for the Wi-Fi and then just this one is the LAN connection if you wanted to connect this EPM, EPM to a LAN connection to give it internet. Okay, looking at the bottom of our first inverter, we've got only one string plugged into this inverter. It's just for demonstration purposes. But you've got your COM1 port. It's a green four pin plug and it's on all our inverters. We have this on all our inverters. And in the box with the EPM, you actually get a set of five of these plugs, which shoot out a blue cable and a yellow cable. And the first letter of blue is B, which stands for RS-485B. So connect all your RS-485Bs onto the blue side. And then the other one is A. So we've only got two cores with regards to our RS-485 communications. And um, you can easily set them up with your COM1 port being the green one. And you just join all the blues together. You stick one in each port in, into each inverter and the EPM and you join all your A's together and you join all your blues together. All your yellows together and all your blues together. 
then if you don't want to use that option because it, it can get a bit tidy because the, the, the cables are a bit short, we have got another solution where you've got on these commercial inverters different options to connect into the RS-485. So here we've got on, on this inverter um, just left of the AC terminal block. And always note when you're doing work on here, make sure you turn off the AC supply to the inverter so that it's off and it's safe to work with. And here you've got these beautiful green plugs that are easily screwed in. So you connect um, A on the right hand side, sorry, B on the right hand side and A on the, on the, le on the left hand side. And this is going, so you've got two plugs in here, two screw, um, two screw in plugs. And this one is going to the EPM. So this is for hosting the communications between this inverter and the EPM. And then the other plug that I haven't removed is for the communications between the next inverter and this inverter. So it's a daisy chain network. That's how RS-405 works, it's a daisy chain. And you connect all the A's together and all the B's together. So I'm just gonna put this back in and this is effectively gonna give communications again back to the EPM for this inverter and the rest of the network. But that's a, a really cool interface to connect into. You've also got options like RJ45s on this inverter. And then on the next inverter I'm gonna look at, we've got the 16 pin plug, which you can also use to connect into the network. Okay, I'm at the final inverter that we're gonna look at, or the final inverter in our EPM control. And here we've got, we've still got that same port for um, COM port one, the green pin, pin, four pin plug, which you can set up and just shoot out a blue and shoot out a yellow and connect it through like I described. And then you've also got this option of a 16 pin plug. So there's two RS-485s in and out on this plug. And you'll see on the screen now the, the pin outs for this plug and you can use this just like you used in the screw-in terminal block. And you get this onto the network, and then once you've addressed the inverters accordingly, it should be all seen by the EPM, and this inverter should be able to be controlled by the EPM. Okay, one of the last steps to do on this on the system to get the EPMs working is set up the inverters. So these inverters need to be addressed, so that's the first thing we're gonna do. And the other thing they need to be is they need to have their fail-safes enabled so that they are constantly looking for the EPM um, and if there is ever not an EPM they need to stop generating as in generator fail safe event. So on all the, each of the inverters as I said in the beginning you set them sequentially so you go to settings and then you set them address so the default is one and you would set this inverter to one and then the next inverter to two and the next inverter to three if you had three inverters. You can't skip any numbers and you have to always start at one. So you need one inverter at least set to one. Then the other thing we need to do is go to advanced settings. So go to advanced settings and menu, press enter. On this inverter to wake it up, you press and hold these two buttons for five seconds. Um, you type in the code, which is 10, like all our products. So you press down to move the cursor across, press up, press enter. Then you scroll through until you see in not internal, external EPM set. Okay, so we go to external EPM set, press enter. This is a 5G EPM, so we press enter on that. And then we have fail safe already on. And it, by default, it is actually set to off, um, but you would need to enable that and you press enter. If you had any commercial, um, communication issues, the, this will make it that the inverter stops generating as soon as you press enter. So if you get an alarm status as you enable that, it's because your communications is not set up or your addressing is not set up correctly. Okay, now moving on to the settings for the EPM. The basic menu structure is that the first screen that you should see is the overview screen. We call this the overview screen. It shows you the status. It shows you the active power, which is the current grid power measured by the EPM using those CTs and the voltage that we've set up and the date and the time and, and so forth. So pressing enter, like all our products, we've given information, settings, advanced information and advanced settings. So the first thing I've seen is that the date is set up incorrectly on this inverter, so on this EPM. So I'm just going to fix that quickly. It's 
the 30th or 31st, apologies. Um, of the 1st, 20, 23. And it's not 5 in the morning, so let's just make it whatever time that we want to make it. And so now the date is correct. Great. Okay data is correct. Then, so for information, we get some very useful information for troubleshooting. If you press enter, again, it brings up the lock icon, yeah. and that's very useful if you just want to look at a specific value. But here, um, this EPM needs to measure voltage, which it is, voltage on phase A, voltage on phase B, and voltage on phase C, and their respective currents for each phase. And, and again, it's very important that those currents and voltages match because it's calculating real power. It bases all of its control on real power. So looking at active AP, you've got your per phase um, active power values. And if the logic for this is very, very important for troubleshooting our direction of our CTs and positive is a good thing, it means that we're generating more solar power than we're using locally so power is going out into the grid so positive means export and negative is a bad thing it means we're using too much electricity not enough of uh, not as much as the solar generation so it will go negative so negative is import positive is export and then we've got a total for here so this screen here is the most helpful for troubleshooting polarity and um, magnitude of your your CT current to see if you've set it up correctly. To set it up, everything basically happens in advanced settings. To get into advanced settings, you press enter to open the menu, scroll down to advanced settings, press enter, type in the code which is 10 or 0010, so the easiest way to type that is down to move the cursor across, down again, and then it's on the third number, press it up once to increment it, press enter and it, it lets you through. The, the, I find that the, the menu structure for this EPM is pretty much English. It's, it's pretty, pretty easy to understand, I think at least. Inverter quantity set means setting how many inverters this EPM needs to look for. So in this case, we've got two inverters set up to it. So we change that to two. Press enter. Then we go to backflow power, which is the amount of power that we are allowed to export out into the grid. And very importantly, there's a sign here again. So if you wanted to set it, there's very few cases that you would want to set that to negative, but if you wanted it to export limit or control the inverters before it even starts to export, you would set that to negative. But here in this case, if we wanted, in my, in my previous example, I wanted to, it to control the inverters when it sees more than 3,000 watts out into the grid. So then you would, you would, um, you would change the, you would press down to move the cursor across and you would look to increment that three times to 300K. Now it's 310, so I just need to get rid of that one and I would increase that until it cycles through back to zero. Now that's set to 300,000 positive, which is 300K. When this EPM detects that the grid power is exporting more than 300,000, it will communicate to the inverters to throttle them back. Then SVG is a power factor correction function. Uh, effectively, you can program this to correct the, well, change the power factor of the inverters so that when, it's, when the EPM sees a, a, a bad power factor, the inverters change their power factor and it corrects that power factor. So it's a very useful uh, function. Okay, but you would have to turn it on, you see. Um, but I don't want it on for the time being. Only if you need it and the customer has this requirement um, set that up. So yeah, that's not something you would always set up by default. And then set meter CT is extremely important. To note here, you can't change the secondary uh, parameter. So if I press down, it, it won't let me change the one. 
and it's the thing about CT ratios is it is a ratio, which means that if you've got a, a for example, a thousand to five CT, you divide both sides by five and you get um, 200 to one, and you would set that to 200 to one. So in this, if, if I did have a thousand amp CTs, I've actually got a hundred to five CTs, so I would set that to, to 20 in that case. So 100 divided by five, which is the secondary value, is 20. So I would set that to 20. So I'd inc increase that number, and then I would increase this again all the way through until it was zero. So now that's 20, that's set correctly. And, and if you don't know the CT ratio of your CTs, you can actually, all the CTs that I've ever seen, actually have it printed on the physical CTs. So you should be able to get it from the CTs themselves if you can't speak to the system designer who purchased them. What's very important for purchasing CTs for this EPM is the primary must be greater than the maximum current that ever went through the system. So if you don't know the, the maximum current that will ever go through the system, the best way to look for that is look at the mains transformer. It will have a silver plate and it will tell you the maximum current. Um, or look at the circuit, uh, a circuit breaker, the, the main circuit breaker, it will have a certain current writing on it and it'll tell you the maximum current that will ever run through that cable. The primary for that CT must exceed that. So if you've got a thousand amp transformer, your, your CTs must be a thousand or higher. So 1000, 1200, 1500. Don't go too high, but you can go a little bit higher. Uh, the higher you go, the less accurate it is. Then the secondary, um, current needs to be five or one. So the, the more accurate is five, but we've tested under G100 up to uh, one amp on the secondary. So both will work, but going down to 33 milliamps, you, you, you need to be careful. Fail safe on off. So you would, you would enable this to run. Essentially, this, it's very important that this EPM is tamper proof. And when a CT breaks or communication breaks, this system needs to go into a fail safe. So you need, it's a good idea to set that to run. Setting backflow work mode for most installations, you would, you would go stick with the default of one. Uh, if you had per phase limiting requirements, you could change that to two. Um, for more details on that, just refer to the user manual. Um, but work mode one in most cases is perfect. P-E-L-D, it stands for power export limitation device on or off. Go to that and switch it on. And then transmit on and off. Just leave that as default as off. Um, or don't, don't even go into it. It's essentially a debugging thing to let you program the inverters through the EPM. System updates if we're doing firmware updates. Reset password and then restore settings and then set capacity is very important to set. Essentially, you're telling the EPM the total amount of rated power inverters connected to it. So if you've got a 50 kilowatt and a 30 kilowatt, you would set that to 80K. Whoa. 80K. Excellent, that's all the, um, the settings, requirements for this EPM, but I would always recommend commissioning and, and testing a setup like this. And the best way to do that is, is messing around with um, the, the backflow power. So what you would expect, if you set this to a very high value, it will allow the inverters to generate. And then when you set it to a lower value or the current active power value, it should control the inverters back. So using that backflow setting can really enable you, and that's another use for this, changing it to negative. You can control the inverters even if it's a negative value. And you need to be able to do that and, and commission it to make sure it's working. And then the other thing that I, often do and always recommend is, as I said in the beginning, use these perfect powers, turn the system into a known state. It's much easier to turn a system into a loaded state than a generating state because you can't control the sun. So what, the way you do that is turn off all the AC supplies to each of the inverters and then the system, generally these industrial sites that these systems go onto, have loads on the system. And what you should be seeing is values on here 
um, and they should all be negative. Because we are importing, because the load is greater than the solar generation, because the solar generation is zero, these should each be negative. If any of them is positive, you've got um, a, a, a CT polarity issue. And then you should also be able to confirm magnitude of these values and these values, um, the currents, by using a handle current clamp on each of the phase cables and comparing it to what the EPM is measuring. And if it's incorrect, you've, you've got it on a, the wrong cable or you're, you've got an earthing issue or you've got a CT um, meter ratio setting incorrect. Okay, so I've, I've, I've set my um, other inverter to address two because I set that one to one and I did that in settings. I've also enabled failsafe on this inverter. So we've completed the installation now. The EPM is correctly measuring the grid power and knowing when the export is exceeded and it's able to control the inverters when that export limit is, is exceeded. So in a nutshell, we have successfully set it up.